I'm going to try to really, I'm going to, I'm, use, I'm using the slides so that you have a little framework, which I think you can go back to and, and use actually as a, a, a thinking process. And I'm not going to talk about everything that's in the slides as a result. I'm going to pick out some, I think, uh, dramatic illustrations for you to consider in the work you do, whether you're involved in academic work or actually field work. In fact, let me have just a, a hand raising here, if you don't mind. How many people are actively engaged in work abroad? Let's see. Okay, it looks like maybe that looks like a could be a half or a third. What do you think? Everyone looking around? Yeah. Huh? Half. Okay. And the rest uh, here to uh, uh, to start out. How about people who are considering uh, working in the social entrepreneurship sector, if you will? One, I guess the, we're called wannabes at one point, right? Okay, a few of those. People who are teaching, I think there's a lot of professors and teachers here, yes? Okay, so who didn't get represented in that? Just people off the street, what, what about you? Okay, good point. That's important because it's not, you know, we're not all uh, just international here. How many people work just internationally? How many people are both international and domestic? That's usually, that's un, sort of unusual. And how many people are domestic? Yeah, okay, good point. Anybody else who wants to out themselves? In any way you'd like. Okay, no one's interested, okay. Um, so this is my landscape and um, we are, as an organization, 16 years old, Worldwide Orphans, and we are working for 15 of those years actively. And we are, we have been in 14 countries doing this and that, which I'll try to uh, just talk about a little bit. And uh, we are currently in five countries. We're in Serbia, Bulgaria for the Eastern European area, and in Asia we're in Vietnam, and in Latin America we're in Haiti, and in Africa, we're in, Eth we're in Ethiopia. So the first thing that's really important, uh, I'm, I wanted to kind of do a little bit of, of a primer here for you, because we're talking, my, the focus of my conversation with you today is about systemic change. And actually, Ned laid out a lot of different aspects of the work we do as social entrepreneurs. And uh, one of the most important aspects of work with children is really systemic change. So my focus for Worldwide Orphans is about long-term enduring change based on using early childhood development principles. So that's the academic piece of it. And in that context, as you might imagine, I'm a pediatrician, and really all I care about is the L word, which is love. And so our core values as an organization are intimacy, connection, capacity building and cultural congruency. I've kind of mixed up a little bit of the sweetness, which is really the intimacy and the connection that are so necessary to help children grow and develop, particularly children at risk, orphans, vulnerable children. But then finally, at the end of the day, as Ned stressed, it's really important for there to be capacity building. And then finally, what's really stressed in most international work, if you do it well, is that every program ends up being different. No matter how many models you have, it will really be based very much on what the culture dictates. Who are the people who are living in a particular country or in a community, whether it's here in the United States, and how do we work in that community to make all of that uh, come together so that people believe and have faith in the programming? Does that make sense? I can't go on at this point another step without making reference to Nelson Mandela. And it's for obvious reasons, but I'll relate it to the work I'm today with you, and that is in regard to a concept of 
collaboration and partnership, which I'll shed light on in a minute, and that is that uh, Nelson Mandela taught us the loftiest of principles, which is there are no enemies, there are only friends and those to love, and in order to move work forward, one must always be respectful of others, no matter what their beliefs are, and even if someone treats you unjustly, that's no reason for you then to be unjust as well. And that is such an important part of the work all of us do. And particularly for me, I can speak personally to the fact that I live by those principles and always have. So the mission, you all have to define yourself. As much as you may hate to do that, you must define your mission, and then you can leave it. I'm going to give you some pieces of advice from all the work I've done all these years, and that is that, you know, who gives a flying fuck about the mission finally at the end of the day? <laughs> I'm going to take you off guard from moment to moment because this room is a room that's uh, filled with elements of sleepiness. <laughs> and I know it well because I've been in this room many times and I have had some nice naps. So. <laughs> I'm noted for my napping, ask my children. I probably can't tell them anything about the movie I just watched with them because I've had myself a good sleep. So the mission, you do have to define a mission and you can't drift from the mission. You do have to keep to it, but there's a lot of flexibility in mission. And I don't even say my mission and so I didn't write it here on purpose because you could look it up and it's really beautiful, but it's really not what finally happens when you do your work. So I have a mission to transform the lives of orphan children so that they're successful and independent in their communities. Doesn't that sound lovely? And it's true. We do that. And we have M&E to prove it. We have metrics. We, we do it. But that's not really the mission. The mission is to really help children understand their identity. It's a deep, abiding mission of all children in the world to know who they are. And orphan children, despite them being relinquished, abandoned, foundlings, abused, victims of trafficking, prostitution, slavery, early marriage. I could go on and on. Children are really beaten down to a pulp at the end of the day and have such unjust treatment, it's hard to talk about. But Children have an identity in spite of all of that. And the mission that I live with every day is to help them to reveal their own identity, that it comes from them, that they can evolve, just as we all have in this room, to their own identity. Vision. So, of course, I could say this because my kids that I take care of are developing. I, I'm lucky, you know, if you read Stanford Innovations, you'll see that there are various models. It's a beautiful journal and the academics of that are hard to resist. I, I indulge every so often when I have a, 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 a moment to breathe and the developmental model is really a beautiful model with which to work for global health and change abroad particularly, but for us as people working with children, we are specifically working with the developmental change over time until a child moves from infancy to toddler to uh, preschool to early childhood and then on to middle school, high school, and youth. So that's a gorgeous model. I love it because I've lived it all these years as a pediatrician, but it also helps you to understand the concept of change. Organizations change over time. And all of us will be talking about that. And that is the beauty of the developmental model, that we track those changes, we're aware of them when we use them to improve our work. Models. Well, everyone creates models and then figures out where they work best, especially culturally speaking. And then we hope in time that we'll replicate those models because they're good enough to be replicated, that they've been proven, that they fit the culture, that they fit the mission and the vision that's created, that they're following strategic planning, that they're building capacity, that they're sustainable. I'm not gonna talk much about sustainability because actually I don't have sustainable programs. What do you think of me making that statement? 
You like it? You don't like it? What do you think? It's the truth that hardly any of us have sustainable programs. And it's a serious problem, but it's not the end of the world. I don't get all excited about not having sustainable programs. It takes time. I'm going to leave you with that important piece that it's important, it's on the list, but it's probably the most difficult aspect of our work, whether domestic or international, and um, it's admirable, but it may take such a long time that people may lose faith and trust in you. That's the hardest part of sustainability, that people are not aware of how important it is that you have the time. I always tell people, give me 50 years. <laughs> now, of course, I don't have 50 years. I'm 62. But metaphorically speaking, 50 years is a good amount of time because it's a generation and a half, actually. In international work, it's a generation and a half. And you can't make psychosocial changes, systemic changes, without time. And anyone who thinks they're nice in giving you a three-year grant, a five-year grant, a seven-year grant, a 10-year grant, they're really not nice. They're short-sighted and foolish, and we should punish them for that. <laughs> you want to join me? We'll flog them a little bit. So I'm in agreement with Ned about um, the issues of Navigator, Charity Navigator, which I find abysmally short-sighted and silly and fake and faux and all the rest of it. Not sure I have time to join him in his campaign because I have too much work to do. Metrics, of course, monitoring and evaluation are ultimately the most important thing you'll ever do. And unfortunately, no one ever invests in it. And then the grantors are expecting you to prove yourself. And then they won't give you the money to invest in M&E. Ridiculous behavior, another bad behavior in international work, which needs changing. Uh, we have a full-time PhD, Anthony Salandi, who does all our M&E, and he's embedding all of our models in each of our countries, teaching theory of change, outcomes, inputs, all that fabulous language, and actually teaching logic models. That's where capacity is really built strongly for M&E. It's to teach in-country staff about the theory of change, to get them invested in a logic model, getting them to think in those terms so they can create long-term planning and M&E and believe in it, trust it, and abide by it. A fundraising that matches growth and partnerships. Ay, ay, ay. This slide is really tough. Um, I'm in the midst currently in such incredible growth and lack of matching my growth with my fundraising. I'm at a juncture in my work in the last two years of not having increased enough, big enough, not having kept the pace of children grow too fast. I have two, they're 13, 15, and like all adults with children who are teenagers, we can't believe that they are who they are. It's shocking to see my two children all grown up, two grown men in my house, fast asleep, very sweet, and I, I, I'm shocked. I go to bed every night, no matter what time I bed at night, I just go in to look at them. Now I just kiss them because they'll move around, they'll probably frown, and I don't want to see them frowning when I'm kissing them, <laughs> even if it's in their sleep. So, but what happens is children who you're serving abroad grow really fast, and keeping pace with them is impossible. So working in this, this sector we're in, domestic or international, working with children, and helping children in misery. Not because it's not beautiful and fabulous and reading, but because it moves too fast and it's hard to keep pace with. So I give you that warning because it's just amazing how it just turn around and I do site visits all the time abroad and I can't believe how old my kids are. From year to year, I go back every year. I was just in Vietnam for two, two weeks and Australia and I couldn't believe my little ones, my tiny little infants in Ba Vi in an orphanage where they relinquished the mothers who were either prostitutes or drug dealers, and there they were now. I was overwhelmed with the beauty of their lives, healthy, well, living with HIV, perfectly normal, bright, fantastic kids, but where did it all go? And I've seen them over the years, I can't believe it, just like my children. Partnerships. That's what I'm going to talk about mostly in my remaining 10 minutes. Partnerships are impossible. 
What kind of a statement is that, right? I'm an idealist, by the way. <laughs> I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist, and I'm not a cynic. I'm truly the most idealist person you'll ever have. But partnerships, there's a Yiddish word. I'm chalishing from partnerships. <laughs> and what that means is that we believe in them. Everyone in this room probably is sitting in that seat and thinking about that word and feeling centered, like you're mindful suddenly. You have this really mindful moment. <laughs> Partnerships, oh my God, I yearn for them. I want to meet another person. I want to email yet another 20. I want to promise them my undying devotion. And then I want to wear a knife-proof vest. <laughs> I'm not sure what we can do about that, but I wish Nelson Mandela were here to somehow infuse that energy and aura he had that belief and trust in human nature. I believe in human nature. I believe in humanity. And I believe partnerships are the most important part of any work we'll ever do. But they fall apart, and they're hard to track, and they're a misery to manage, and you have to pour a huge amount of energy into them to make them happen. And they're necessary but they'll take the life out of you. And you can't forget how incredibly important they are when you're having the most trouble with them. I have recently, in the last couple of years, two partnerships abroad, one in Bulgaria and now in Ethiopia, that have completely disintegrated, no matter how hard I tried. And they're long standing, one 10 years, one's 19. No matter how hard I tried, it didn't matter because if the other side doesn't have the same commitment and there are cultural differences, clearly, that's the most difficult part. But I'm going to give you the, I'm going to, as an idealist, I don't want you to suddenly feel, how could she be an idealist because that sounds awfully pessimistic. It's not. Let me give you the secret to maintaining partnerships. And that is, you cannot be afraid to tell the truth in a partnership. Once you are afa afraid to tell the truth, your partnership will fail. So, if, at least I was, to make sure that the family felt I was committed to that patient till their last breath. Does that have anything to do with managing an NGO? No. Nothing. I'm a bad manager. I'm about excellence. I'm about being compulsive. I'm about being relentlessly hardworking. And I'm about expectations that are beyond capacity. Would you want to work for me? No. <laughs> but I'm a great leader. And great leaders can learn, actually, to manage better, as long as it's something that gets diagnosed along the way. You don't make the diagnosis, then you will not only be a bad manager, but you'll be a bad leader. Leadership is key in the work we do, really key. And it's just not about inspiration. And it's not just about passion. Leadership is about destiny. I'll talk a little bit more about that and then we're gonna finish. Let's see, where's that red light? Two minutes till completely done, like my neck is cut off. Great, okay. Getting ready, my neck is, got, I got a scarf, that's why I wear a scarf. Um, so, I can't talk to you about destiny, but if, you, if we see each other in a little while or up at the panel, ask me about destiny. It is key, and it is never discussed, ever in any conference. And it is the most important part of leadership and people who lead know they have destiny, but they forget sometimes to talk about it. Other issues here to finish up, board support. Boards are a pain in the ass. Very difficult to manage. Very important. Constant, you must constantly be cultivating and loving your board, and you must constantly be aware 
of board members who micromanage because micromanagement is completely at odds with leadership. You don't need a micromanaging board. You need a board that's supportive, that's involved, engaged, has faith and belief in, the, in your work, but doesn't micromanage. Public relations and social media, I just put it on there because it's clearly very important to all of us, especially those of you here who are a lot younger than myself. I believe in it, I invest in it, I love it. I'm not sure I understand it all yet. I clearly don't know how social media will be monetized. That's a mystery, but I'm hoping that like everything else, that it will unfold. And just finishing, these are some of my youth from our youth training program in Haiti, which is a gorgeous program and hugely about capacity building and systemic change. And I'm done. Yay!